I want to begin today by reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. <clears throat> There's an interesting word here. Everybody's okay. That's good. First Corinthians 16, 21 to 23. The salutation of me, Paul, with my own hand if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anath anathema, maranatha. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Maranatha. This word is, uh, has a very interesting background. In the days of great persecution, when Rome was persecuting people, persecuting Christians in the first century and beyond, in, in many places it was not safe to admit that you were a Christian. They had a password. It could mean death. The word was coined, a password that the Roman persecutors would not understand. It was a Aramaic word. This word has so much significance to Christian history that it was not even translated. Given in our Bibles in its original form, Maranatha. There is in the great, there in the great city of Rome as Christians would pass one another. You might hear them greet each one another quietly, Maranatha. And the other would quietly reply, Maranatha. And the word would bring a sparkle to their eyes and a look of hope in their faces. The word means, our Lord will come. Amen. I like the way you sang that song this morning. It's almost time for the Lord to come, right? That ought to be a passion between Adventists that we know Jesus will come soon. And we must be prepared for that day. Early Christians were known as the people with the uplifted gaze. The angel said in Acts, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, will so what? Can you finish it? Come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Wow. God's true followers from that time to this have been looking heavenward for the second coming of Jesus. By the way, we're Adventists here this morning, right? What does that mean? We're looking for the second advent of Jesus Christ, Maranatha. That was the, that was the blessed hope. Titus 2.13 says, and looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The blessed hope. If there ever was a time when we should have the uplifted look, it's now. And the people who should have the uplifted look more than any on, the, on, the, on, on earth should be Adventists seven days a week, looking for the advent of Jesus, moment by moment. Yes, looking for Jesus to come. If there ever was a time, it ought to be right now. Where are you eyes, your eyes these days? Are they on Jesus as he performs his ministry is our high priest in heavenly places. Is that where we go? That's where our prayers are, right? They all go to that place. Or are they much on television and internet searches and computer games? You know, I've been into some of that stuff in the past. It takes a lot of time. Boy, you can spend an hour or two and pretty soon the time is all gone, right? And it's time to do something else. Uh, are they on uh, are our eyes on clothes or mistakes of others or entertainment? Or are they on Jesus with a determination to be ready for his soon coming? We shouldn't concentrate on the small things. What are the small things? Inflation? That's a small thing. 
compared to celestial things. Tires? You know, those are important things, but they're not the big things. I talked to somebody this week that needs a set of tires on their car and don't have any money for it. How about car repairs? Met somebody else this week is having that problem. These are the small things. The great things are celestial. Jesus is coming. Every passing day brings us closer to the end. To me, that's a tremendous thought. In Noah's, in Noah's day, God is seen as long-suffering. Noah began to preach. The flood is coming. How long did he preach that message? 120 years. Long-suffering. God is long-suffering. God is, in his loving patience, waited 120 years. This is a character of God issue here. This is how he is. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Even in the days of Noah, the Lord is not a slacker. He's not slack concerning his promises, the Bible says. However, let us not let God's patience cause us to neglect, even though it may appear to take longer than we anticipated. I'd like to have us turn, if you'll turn with me, to Matthew chapter 24, 35 to 37. Matthew 24. This is that great chapter where Jesus is answering a question from the disciples. What will be the signs of your coming in the end of the world? And the whole chapter is worthy of our, of our uh, close attention. 35 to 37. It says... Heaven and earth shall not pass away, shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and the hour knows no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. There are three chapters in, uh, in Matthew that I would, I would like to urge you to spend a little time with. Matthew chapter 24, 25, those two chapters, 24 and 25. Jesus is answering that question. Uh, and he says, when you see all these things beginning to happen, when they're all happening at once, I think they're all happening at once right now, my friends. And I think we, t we, we really are in times that are very serious times right now. First Thessalonians 5 is the third chapter that I'd like to have you spend some time with. Uh, Jim, thank you for reading that this morning. First Thessalonians 5. What do we know about First Thessalonians 4? We all go there, don't we, when we talk about the second coming of Jesus. Chapter 5 is all about how to be ready when he comes. I'll have to tell you, if you look at that chapter and take that into your heart, you'll be ready for Jesus to come. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. All those kind of things are in that chapter. So uh, put this in your heart. There are interesting days ahead. I want to describe some of those interesting days that are just ahead of us. One of them is the judge judgment of the living generation. Hmm. The final atonement. The latter rain. And the sealing. And the trumpets. And the spirit of prophecy says, trumpet after trumpet will sound. What are trumpets for anyway? Put people to sleep? <laughs> Announce. They're, they, they, are, they are an alarm. In, in ancient Israel, it was a time of, when they went into battle, right? Also, it was an announcement of the Day of Atonement. A tremendous gospel idea. And uh, all the world will hear in a loud cry. The close of human probation. Then fall the seven last plagues. All this between us and the second coming, but it won't take very long. Once these things begin to happen, they will happen in their order very, very rapidly. If you're a little rusty on some of these things, or if you are new to our faith, I would suggest I would like to invite you to come on Tuesday night Bible study at my house or Friday night Bible study at my house or the Wednesday night Bible study for prayer meeting. We have prayers there. It's prayer meeting, right? And then we also talk about some of these things that I just mentioned. 
We're study, studying these vital issues. If we know them, it will bring Maranatha excitement. Jesus said, be ye also ready. You find that in Matthew 24, 44. As the pre-advent judgment comes to the living generation, we need to be ready. It is a special urgency to the people of God. I'd like to invite you to turn with me next to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Right near Revelation. 1 Peter chapter 4. Verses 17 to 19. It says, for the time has come that judgment must begin where? In the house of God, at the house of God. For if it begin, for if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? For if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit his keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as to a faithful creator. A good description of the judgment of the living, which is just ahead, is found in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3. We are living in the hour of God's judgment. Is that right? Yes. Hour of God's judgment is come. It's not coming. It is here. And it'll close with the living generation. I think the angels must be in great awe as they, take, as they wonder, how is God going to deal with the living generation? And this is one of the things, Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Here's what it says. Behold. I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Who may abide the day of his coming? Now, this is not talking about the second coming of Jesus. This is talking about the judgment. And the spirit of prophecy uses this passage in that context. Notice here. Who may be, abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? For he is like refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He shall stand, sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. And verse 4, Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem, referring in the New Testament to God's church, right? Then shall Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. Suddenly, unexpectedly, he will come to the names of the living generation. And it must not find us like a thief in the night. When a thief comes, does he throw rocks on your roof and let you know, hey, here I am? No, it's something that takes people by surprise, like a thief in the night. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is the chapter that, that uh, Jim read from a little earlier. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. This is that chapter that, if we take it very seriously, it will give us a readiness for the second coming. Verse five, chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a what? Thief in the night. And when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail of a woman with child, and they shall not escape. The idea, peace and safety, and then sudden destruction, they almost seem... Uh, opposites. From Jeremiah, he said, and said it several times, that the first fall of Jerusalem is also a type of the final generation. As you read Jeremiah, you can hardly make a difference, just like Matthew 24. Is he talking about the fall of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, or is he talking about our day? And uh, it's an interesting read. Matthew 25. 
talks about five wise and five foolish virgins. This parable about the bridegroom coming is not, is not the second coming of Christ in power and glory to this earth. The bridegroom is coming. It refers to a happening that takes place in heaven. The marriage takes place in heaven while we are still on earth. And when he comes a second time, he comes from the wedding to take us to the great marriage supper, the Lamb. What an idea. It refers to the judgment of the living. This is the marriage that takes place in heaven while we are on earth when Christ makes up his jewels in the judgment, the pre-advent judgment. Let's look at it in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Let's start with verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered to him and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. In the great heavenly courtroom in heaven, all these angels in Revelation chapter four and five, a repeat of that scene only it adds some others, 24 elders and four living creatures, and all these angels are mentioned again. And the judgment is set, and the books are opened. And verse 13, And I saw, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the, what? Clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom and all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. And Daniel is grieved, it says in the next verse. The judgment scene. Revelation 21, verse 2. God's kingdom includes people. Revelation 21, verse 2. In fact, the kingdom is his people, right? God is not nearly as interested in the streets of gold as he is his people. They are the apple of his eye. They are the ones to whom he uh, has been turning his attention for centuries now. And we've come to the time in Earth's history when this is going to be a reality. Notice what it says here in chapter 21, verse 2. I, saw, I John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared, what does it say next? As a bride, beautiful city. He should remind us of his people. That's what he looks at us. That's how he looks at us. It's prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Interesting that in chapter 19 of Revelation, it says the bride has made herself ready. Who is the bride, by the way? It's his church. You know, as individuals, we are his children, his sons and daughters, right? But as a church, we are his bride. God make makes up his jewels in the judgment. And then the great test comes and his people have made preparation and um, he takes them home. And while the judgment goes forth in heaven, they that feared the Lord met often one with another, it says in Malachi 3, and the Lord hearkened and heard in that day when I make up my jewels. Where does he make up his jewels? That's in the judgment hour, right? In which we're living. And uh, many virgins, even maybe those who profess a pure faith are not preparing for the marriage. Judgment of the living. You can read about that in the Great Controversy, the chapter Investigative Judgment. Many of God's professed people think they're on solid ground. I want to read a passage from Jeremiah, Old Testament. Remember Jeremiah? He talks about the destruction of Jerusalem to come, but he's also talking about the end time in the time in which we're living. Jeremiah chapter eight, verses eight and nine. Jeremiah eight, verses eight and nine. 
It says, how do you say we are wise? Anybody ever say that? <laughs> how do you say we are wise? And the Lord, law of the Lord is with us. Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. And lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord. And what wisdom is in them? What wisdom is in them? This is almost like the Laodicean message. Advent people waiting for Jesus to come. Laodicea, that message in Revelation chapter 3, has to do with the judgment hour in which we're living. Judgment is a time of urgency. Is that right? I don't know how many of you have been in court. I've been a witness in court several times. And uh, I'll tell you what, it it's, has something to do with urgency. It has something to do with seriousness, right? The hour of judgment has come. The Laodicean message to the Advent people just before Jesus comes. Wise men. Ashamed? Self-comforted ones. Laodicean means judging of the people. Who are the judge? We're living in the hour of God's judgment. And this lukewarm condition that's mentioned in the Laodicean message must not be found among us. Lukewarm. What's lukewarm mean? Do you ever eat lukewarm food? <laughs> you know, uh, some foods are good cold, right? You don't want to eat hot ice cream, right? Some foods are good hot. Perfectly good either way. The true witness says, I wish you were what? Either hot or cold. No, but no one likes lukewarm food. It's nauseating to God to have a lukewarm bride who seems to be too good to be lost and too evil to be saved. That's what lukewarm is. Too good to be lost and too, <laughs> too bad to be saved. That's the predicament that God is in with his chosen ones in Laodicea. Laodicea is that last day church, the church of the judgment. Now, in fact, Laodicea means judging of the people. That end time church that just before Jesus comes are the ones who are being judged. They are not excited about the marriage in Revelation 3. They are not on fire with passion for Christ. It's like Solomon. In the book Solomon, Song of Solomon, his lovely, his lovely lover is mentioned. It's in the morning. They've already been married. The marriage has settled down a little bit. King Solomon comes to the door and he calls her. He has great plans for that day. It's going to be an outing today. What is her response? Here's what she says. This is found in Song of Solomon 4, verse 3. I sleep. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? By getting out of bed and going with him, right? She doesn't want to get out of, out of bed to be with him so early in the morning. But uh, then she finally comes to the door. Kind of with the attitude, what do you want? And lo, let's look at it. Song of Solomon. Chapter 5, verse 6. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 6. It's right after Ecclesiastes, one of the Solomon's works. Song of Solomon, 5, verse 6. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved hath withdrawn himself and was gone. Finally, she gets up out of bed and she goes to the door and he's gone. My soul failed when I spoke, when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. And then she goes out and it describes it. She goes out into the streets now to find him. Looking for him, she asked the night watch, watchman and others. They've, uh, have they seen him? They realize 
Then she begins to realize how much she's missing. Verse 8, chapter 5, verse 8. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick of love. In other words, I am lovesick. <laughs> okay. If you find him, tell him that I'm, that I'm lovesick now. Okay. I'm missing my lover. This is the experience of Jesus with the lukewarm church. My friends, the time is now. He's standing at the door and knocks. That's in the Laodicean message. And he longs for us to go to quickly put on our garments, those beautiful garments of salvation, for the time is short. These foolish virgins, indeed, this is the sleep of the virgins that we're too busy right now, or we're too sleepy. What a, what a rebuke that is to us. You know, I said last time I was here, that I'm preaching to myself this morning, hoping a few more others are listening in too. If not now, when? Could we covenant together here today as family to put first things first? Where the times demand that we put first things first. There's a sense in which God is, is himself is on trial. Did you know that? God himself is on trial. Lucifer put, put the blame on God. He says to the angels, the law restricts us too much. God is too restrictive. Therefore, it's his fault, says Satan. But man was created to make God's character known, not to be a lawless generation, but to be a, but be a lawful generation. So Satan says, See there, Adam and Eve, they couldn't keep the law either. You see his reasoning? <clears throat> Thus the character of God is manifested, is misrepresented, I'm sorry. And so the whole government of God is on trial. But God didn't just throw us away. He had an eternal purpose for us. God himself had to come to this world as one of us, the second or the last Adam, and Christ is in our organ, and he came in our organism so that the true unselfish character of God could be lived out and put on full display. Indeed, indeed the character of God in Christ when he was here was put on full display to the whole universe, to the whole onlooking universe. The devil says, fair enough, as if he says to Jesus, but you're God, sure, you could do it, you're God. That doesn't prove anything, he says. And then he asks the Lord, where are the people? Where are the people who can live your character? Where are they? And God also says, fair enough. Here is God's response to all this nonsense of the devil. Let's look at it. Revelation 14, verses 1 to 5. This is talking about the final generation. I don't know if we're in the final generation. I kind of think we are. The uh, signs all around us seem to indicate that we're living in very serious times. Don't you, would, would you say so? Let's look at 1 to 5. <clears throat> Revelation 14, verses 1 to 5. Here's what it says. This is God's answer to the devil. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having the Father's name written in their foreheads. What does that mean? Father's name in their foreheads, what does that mean? His character. Names in the Bible have to do with character. God gave Jacob a new name. His name was a liar, right? A deceiver. And he gave him a new name. What was his new name? Israel. Prince of God, that's what that word means, or overcomer, a new name. And these, these have the Father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as it were the voice of many waters, and as the voice of, many, of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with harps. And they sang, as it were, a what kind of a song? 
a new song. This kind of a song never been sung before in this world. A new song before the throne and before the four, four living creatures and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were re redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women. For they are virgins. What does that mean? They have a pure faith, right? Their faith in God is, is complete. You couldn't move them. They have been settled into the truth, so they could not be moved. These are the sealed ones. They're described in Revelation chapter 7, the first, seven, first four or five verses. They are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And furthermore, He says, fair enough. Take a look at these people. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. No, literally, that means here is the steadfast endurance of the holy ones. Here they are, Satan. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What an idea. This is God's purpose for the final generation, to vindicate God's character. Instead of just being an Enoch here and a Daniel there, and a Moses there, here's a whole community of them. A complete number. The final generation. That's what the final generation looks like. And uh, what does all this mean to us? These people vindicate the character of God. What a privilege it would be to be a part of the last community of Christians called the remnant who live the character of unselfish God and put that character on full display between men, before men and angels. What would it be like to be in that kind of a situation? The world's afar for men and angels to see, vindicating, and they're doing it from free choice. They love him. Jesus once said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. This is a love on the heart that's filled their hearts with praise because they love Jesus. Their faith is pure and strong. They're settled into the truth. They can't be moved. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They are true followers. Followers are disciples, right? You want to be a follower? Yeah, we need to give ourselves to God in the morning. Make that our very first work. And spend some time in the Word learning to know Jesus whom to know is eternal life. They don't have any of the religion of Babylon. They follow the Lamb. They hasten, they hasten to the open door. Revelation 4, verse 1, the very, very next verse, right after the, the Laodicean message, they hasten to the door. The door is opened, and they go through that door. They are the first fruits to God. Why would they be called first fruits? This is the first community of saints now that is following Jesus fully and completely. The first community. Yes, there have been individuals. Enoch was one of them. He was wholly given to God. God said, I can't leave him here anymore. You've got to take him to heaven. He was 300 plus years old. Took Elijah to heaven. What a man of faith he was. But here's a whole community of them. And so this is the road ahead for the people of God. Nothing short of this. This is, should be where our horizon is. This should be what we should be looking forward to. A trip takes planning. We're about to go on the trip of the ages. This plan ahead. The heavenly lover calls us. Confession and forsaking of sin through the grace of our great God should be our goal. This is what it means to have our sins go beforehand into judgment. This should be on our mind every waking moment. Hundred and forty four thousand is a symbolic number. Everything here is symbolic. Twelve tribes. Character traits of God's end time people.
144,000 are a multiple of what number? 12. God's kingdom number. This is that rock that somebody spoke of here that comes out of the mountain. It represents God's kingdom, composed of people, and fills the whole world. Our message is to carry the gospel to where? The whole world. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, stand on the sea of glass one day because of this. They're the first fruits, the final monuments of God's grace. They have gone through the ceiling and emerged victorious. In every village and hamlet, God is going to have people who are monuments to his grace and his love. They stand like Enoch and Elijah's and Daniel's in a perverse and rebellious generation. They go through the ceiling time. They stand without fault before God's throne. They have received the latter rain of the Holy Spirit. These are God's first fruits. And the devil goes forth with fury. He doesn't like it. You can read the last verses of Daniel 11. He says he goes, goes forth to make away many. He wants to destroy them. It makes him so angry. They have washed their robes, but they've also smelled the dragon's breath. This is why we need to be found in Christ every day. Anybody here smell the dragon's breath? And then the fragrant latter rain falls upon them. Their sins have been blotted out in the judgment of the living, the closing, cleansing work of the Day of Atonement. They are God's Exhibit A. They are God's witnesses. They voluntarily keep God's commandments as the fruit of, their, of the righteousness that is of faith. The fact that they keep the commandments is the evidence and the judgment that they're in Christ. Evidence. Our good works are the evidence that we are desirous of living God's character in a perverted in a perverse world. These will be Sabbath keepers by the grace of God. They're worshiping the creator God in obedience to the first angel's message. They have received the seal of God in their foreheads. What does that mean? That's his character, right? The law written in the mind and in the heart. It's God's character. Is God's character a character of love and goodness? Uh, I don't have time to go to Revelation, or Romans 13, but it talks about, that's the best definition of love I've ever seen. It talks about those who keep his commandments and that love is the fulfilling of the law. They have love in their hearts. They've allowed the Holy Spirit to come into their lives and carve away those un undesirable traits that all of us have so that we'd be ready for Jesus to come. Don't you see what a wonderful privilege we have in these last days to vindicate the God's character before the, before the universe? They witness before a universe that has learned to hate sin with a bitter disgust. As they see the things that are going, here, going on in here in the earth, the, un, the intelligent beings who have not fallen look at, look at this earth in bitter disgust. And so should we. There's something better. Maranatha. Jesus is coming. They hate sin with a bitter disgust and they have seen the sorrow that sin has brought to the heart of God. These angels. I want to search out my guardian angel when I get to heaven. I want to find out what he thinks about all this. He knows God. He knows his character of love. And he realizes that as I stand on the sea of glass, I am a monument to his grace and his goodness. No other reason for being there except that God, you know, we should have thankful, praiseful hearts, but thanksgiving and praise comes only because of what God has done first and has trickled down to me. The suffering of Jesus did not begin or end at the cross. 
But the cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that is from its inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. And this final generation that's talked about here are going to vindicate that character before the universe and the devil is going to go away and he's going to look at this thing and he's going to be filled with wrath. He says, the devil comes down to you like a roaring lion. But I'll tell you what, you're safe in the arms of Jesus. Don't worry about those things. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but of a sound mind, right? A sound mind is one that has turned its mind to Jesus. Sin is a form of insanity. We've all been drenched in it. And uh, so these people are the first fruits. Then God says, I'm going to resurrect my saints. <laughs> The saints of all the ages, the general harvest. That final generation is the first fruits, right? In ancient Israel, there was also a going back and harvesting the general harvest. So what would it be like to be a part of the final generation and be the first fruits? The first community of saints who have given themselves to God so completely and the grace of God just drenches their hearts. They're just so happy, so thankful that he's done what he's done for us. And then the general harvest follows that. First Thessalonians, we're just about done here. First Thessalonians chapter four. Jim read from First Thessalonians five a while ago. But uh, First Thessalonians four, verses 16 and 17. We don't just read this at funerals. This is a real thing for us. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself. Who? The Lord. the Lord himself. The real one. The one that was here. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel. With the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive. Some of us will still be alive. The final generation will be alive when Jesus comes. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Anybody here need comfort? I tell you, I do. 1 Corinthians 15 is another one. It's just before Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 53. I'll tell you, when we really get a hold of this, We'll leave no stone unturned in helping other people be a part of the final generation too. 51 to 53. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Why would he grant immortality to people? <laughs> because he knows that the cross is the eternal antidote for sin. And he knows that this people, who have been through all of this, the great time of trouble such as never was since there was a world, he knows that this people will never leave him or forsake him. We must covenant together to all be there, part of that group, and take all the people we can with us. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? Maranatha, right? It should be our password. Give your heart to Jesus in the morning. Give your heart to him in a meaningful way. He'll inspire you with his Holy Spirit. He'll give you an experience that you'd never dream possible. Happiness and joy. He will create such faith in your heart that you'll love Jesus supremely. And that faith brings a strong love for Jesus. And if we love, Je love him, what will we do? We'll do everything we can to please him, to be with him. This faith comes in the powerful word of God. 
Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's stay close to the word. Let's be people of the book in these last days so that we can be faithful witnesses and share with others the good news that animates us.